Hello and welcome back to Digitally. You know, sustainability is such a large agenda for all of us, and we've been spending time on this. In fact, at GenPAC, we just published a research report jointly with Fortune. And one of the things that clearly shows us is that companies that are leading with climate-related sustainability practices are actually outperforming others in their industry. And in other words, what we're finding out is sustainability, we always knew was good for the environment, but it's actually good for business. So today I've invited someone who I think you will really enjoy speaking with. She's forged a career around her passion in sustainability. They've delivered so many firsts in sustainable buildings. We'll find out about that in a second. And she's used innovative data and technology to drive sustainability initiatives across an entire industry. And they've built the industry's first standard embodied carbon calculator. She's a director, uh, executive director at buildingtransparency.org. Welcome, Stacy Smedley. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Stacy. There's so much to discuss and unpeel today. Before we do any of that, you did not start your career thinking you were going to be driving sustainability and working what you work on. And so I'm curious, first off, to take a step back and get a sense for your life journey and what got you to doing what you're doing today. Sure. Yeah, I definitely didn't think I'd be sitting where I am now um, as an executive director of basically a nonprofit tech startup. <laughs> um, but when I was a when I was a kid, um, I grew up in a part of Oregon that was pretty rural. Uh, my grandpa had bought um, some acreage, and he built a house that um, we shared with my mom and my grandparents. Um, and it was in rural Oregon. It was surrounded by trees and nature. And uh, I just had this experience where I could go out and be in nature every day as my my playground. Um, and when I was around eight, uh, it was um, it was decided to sell our land. My grandpa was over 80 and not able to maintain it anymore. Um, we kept the house and I watched us basically that entire natural environment that I'd um, appreciated and just really grown up in uh, clear cut and um, turned into just uh, asphalt cul-de-sacs and uh, dirt lots and then a bunch of houses that looked exactly the same were built, you know, in a matter of months. Um, and I, I told my mom that I wanted to grow up and um, find a way to build buildings that didn't destroy nature. So I couldn't understand why someone would decide to just come do that. Um, but I thought architecture was going to be the way to do that. So I started in architecture, got my degree in architecture, designed buildings um, that I, I tried to make restorative and, and uh, less impact on the environment, and positive impact on the environment. Did some first there uh, with some innovative projects through the Living Building Challenge and the lead rating system, but realized that I was only really impacting one building at a time. Uh, and that wasn't a scale of impact that was going to do what eight-year-old Stacy was trying to do. Um, so uh, I started looking at the construction sector uh, because I was engaging with contractors like Skanska uh, who have very large portfolios building a whole bunch of buildings at once all over the world. And I saw a potential for a larger impact so I uh, asked for a job at Skanska. Uh, I, I got that job uh, doing pre-construction estimating first, just to get my, um, my feet underneath me with what construction looked like and how we quantified materials and, and built, um, and then worked my way into a sustainability director role at Skanska, um, just through kind of living that passion. And I will tell you over the past 10 years in that role, the amount of clients that are looking for sustainability uh, objectives in their projects and really requiring certain targets and reductions has grown exponentially. Um, and that team of, of just a few of us at Skanska has grown uh, quite a bit over the, the past 10 years. So that's how I kind of moved into a larger impact in the built environment space and then uh, digging into those emissions of, of all the things that we build with uh, and, and the equipment that we used. Um, I started realizing there was a gap in the data that we had available to us to actually, you know, dig into the those emissions and reduce them. Um, and that led me to developing the embodied carbon construction calculator that would basically allow myself as an end user, but also anyone else that wanted to access environmental impact data about construction materials to do so in a free open platform. So it's a, yeah. it's not I, where I am now is where I thought, not where I thought I would be, but I've always been looking for that way to make impact. Um, and I feel like I'm doing that now. Stacey, it's such an inspiring journey, um, I think. And I wish we have more of those eight year old Stacey's in the world that take on the next set of challenges and opportunities. And indeed you've accomplished so much. Um, we'll get into a little bit of what you do, um, but the bit uh, you said about uh, even in the journey so far, you've seen how many corporations are now solidly getting behind it and how demand and interest has gone up is actually a leading indicator where we are in the world. So 
Um, so that's actually been fantastic to hear from you and your journey is so inspiring. That said, you are at a point now where you are running transparency.org. What is it? Tell us a little bit more about what, what, what you do there. Sure. Yeah. So um, Building Transparency uh, was launched in early 2020 uh, as a nonprofit, uh, really to take over the uh, management and maintenance and scaling of the Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator, which is that free open access tool that gives everyone uh, access to this emissions data of construction materials. Um, so the, the nonprofit was launched once the tool had been incubated, um, coming out of Skanska and Microsoft seed funding and then at a university. It needed a home. Uh, none of us that had worked on the tool besides the software developer understood software. Uh, so we developed this tool, we got it to work, and then it needed a place to go um, to continue to, to be maintained. So um, the mission of the nonprofit is free open access tools and data uh, to reduce embodied carbon emissions of construction. We do all sorts of things around that. We host the data, we put it in open digital format, we provide the tool that allows you to use the data. And then we also do a whole bunch of work around um, the data modeling uh, and the education of the industry uh, to really understand how to use this data and make uh, reductions of things like uh, emissions of concrete or steel. So, you know, um, it's super interesting because I often think about, you know, walking into a grocery store and picking up an item off the supermarket and you can look at, you can look at a food product as an example and tell exactly how many calories that it has, what are the carbohydrates and so on and so forth. I mean, really, uh, are we getting to a stage that we can have very similar publicly available, easily consumable, standardized sort of reporting that you and I can look at and kind of get a sense for what the carbon intensity of a product is. Talk to us a little bit about your vision there. Sure. Is that reality? Is that going to be happening? Where we yeah, going? I mean, that's really, um, when I was digging into how to source this data, which was the carbon intensity of materials, it led me to environmental product declarations, which are a third-party verified ISO standardized um, approach to presenting all this uh impact data for products, not just construction products, but really anything. And so um, if you think about it like an environmental nutrition label, just like we want to go find the low carb cereal if we're on a low carb diet where we've got the carbs per serving size, um, EPDs allow us to actually look at the carbon intensity per unit of a material uh, at that same kind of level of disclosure, the product level. Um, so, so yes, I mean, our, our database, what we did was figure out a way to basically digitize all of these published environmental product declarations into a standard format. Uh, we ingest them into the database. We then use it for our user interface for construction materials, but we're now reading in EPDs for all sorts of things. So um, I think that the test case and the proof case of what we've done with EC3, the, the calculator for construction materials, uh, based on this data that we now have available, is something that is absolutely scalable to basically anything that you can think of it that's a product. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're just on the cusp of that and we're seeing so what happens when we're doing that construction. I want to come to that product in a minute because um, I think it has broader implications based on what you just said. But before we go there, you know, look, this is an audience. This is a set of people we meet regularly. And this is really the digital transformation professionals from across the globe or deep into technology and data. You went to it really quickly, but I think many attentions, uh, many people caught the words you said. But just to rewind a little bit, right, tell us what it took to pull this together because mm -hmm. These declarations are available, but presuming they're in different formats and in different sources, and there's trust issues, there's data extraction issues. Um, is it simply API and you just pull it in? Are you using NLP or AI? Just, just walk us through essentially how you build this platform in the first place. Sure, yeah. So when I was first sourcing the data, my frustration was that these declarations lived on multiple websites, either those that were publishing them and verifying them for a manufacturer on a manufacturer website where you could just grab it. But they were all PDF documents. So I would have to go in and extract all these PDFs into a folder, go to page six, find the carbon intensity, put it in an Excel spreadsheet, and then try to do these comparisons that I wanted to do. So it was highly inefficient. Um, so the proof of concept of the tool was really to do what you just said, which was um, figure out how to slurp that into a standard format. And the first thing that we had to do was just um, machine read PDF documents. So a bunch of scripts that can understand different formats of PDFs that are coming from different places. Um, pull that into, again, a standard digital format we call Open EPD, um, where we have a schema with standard fields. Um, and then once it's all in that standard digital format, um, again, build our user interface on top of it for how we think it should be engaged with for construction, but also all of the data is available through an open API because we're a nonprofit. We're very uh, mission-driven and I now understand and 
very much believe that the data needs to be open and access and free. And then all of the different competition for the best tool and the you know the startups that want to build upon the data can can be that next year. Uh, but we need to be all using the same open access data that's consistent and verified um, to do this accounting. So okay, so this is fascinating because obviously AI and all the extraction AP, uh, uh, automation, many of those components, uh, I can just see how you've used them. But on the non-technology side, it sounds like collaboration and trust is a big thing because my API, your API, my standard, your standard, you work for Scansa or you came from Scansa into this, into this uh, organization. Why would we follow your standards as opposed to coming up with my own standards? How did you get the industry around this? Sure. Yeah. So the, the good thing is, is that we started with a, a verified source of data that's already based on a global standard. So the fact that environmental product declarations, the source of the data are published based on ISO standards, the third party verified through product category rules, there's a whole global consistency around that component of it. So uh, what we did is, is fill the gap of the inconsistency in the format of what's published. So we are not creating the data, we're not verifying the data, we're just consuming it into a format that um, is consistent and standardized. Um, and there is one other format in Europe called ILCD that's done something similar. Um, we've learned from what they've done, we've added more specific fields, um, and, and we just think that we've got something now that can be globally applicable. It's kind of like the USB, right? Like where you, you've got the USB standard, people can make it look like a panda or a, you know, a bamboo stick, um, but you can plug it into any computer because uh, the standard is the same. Um, to get consensus on that, it's been, you know, we still are. Um, there's just, you have to engage with everyone along that whole value chain. So the manufacturer that's going to disclose, having them understand if they use this format, it's going to an open access database. Program operators that are publishing, um, if they adopt the format, we can start doing it digitally even and really get more efficiencies around it. Um, and they can know all their data is going into the central repository for access by anyone. Um, and then the users, um, all the users of EC3 really want the data all in one place in one format so they can do comparisons and all the things they need to do. Um, so getting them to actually request the data in that format and start to build the consensus around the fact that it's um, what we need uh, for comparability and access. Uh, that's a big part of what we, what we do actually at Building Transparency. And to really make that happen, and Stacey, you stepped out of your role at Scansa to come into this role and become an independent organization. Was that part of the game plan? And sort of how you brought that about? Yeah, when we were first doing the proof of concept of the tool, um, you know, I was I went and I applied for a seed uh, seed funding grant through an innovation grant program at Skanska. And it was very explicitly, you know, listed by me and also believed by Skanska that we couldn't do this in a proprietary way with Skanska's name uh, all over it. Uh, we wanted ado adoption and we wanted credibility and a, a larger collective impact. Um, so, I mean, that, that's really how it started. And now, they're still paying my salary instead of donating, you know, money to the nonprofit. They're they're funding my role at building transparency to make sure that the uh, the tool and what they started continues to uh, to be successful and gain traction. Wow, that's amazing! I didn't know that, but that's uh, you know we have so many people on this uh, in this conversation that are CIOs, CDOs, CTOs, and many of us and I do as well fund uh, innovation kind of incubation thing inside the company. And you you're such a great example of something that started as a as a small incubation project, but has grown so much since then. So congratulations on that. So you see, I have one other area I wanna explore with you. I think you hinted at it earlier. What you built today obviously serves the construction industry, which is fantastic. And there's some next steps you're taking there. But I think you alluded to the fact that what you've done so far might apply broader. This is a group of digital transformation professionals across the globe. I think one of the things we wanna do is lean in on how do we build on the shoulders of others? How do we incorporate new capabilities that are already existing and build things on top? How far can we take what you've built? How do we participate? What can we do with it? Sure, yeah, so like I said, um, the nonprofit and even the EC3 tool, it's the embodied carpet and construction calculator. So we are keenly focused on those construction materials. But as I mentioned, um, because uh, EPDs are a global standard that aren't just for construction products, they're for any product. Um, there are EPDs published for things like uh, fashion, um, food, uh, technology and all the different items that we would go and procure as a consumer. And our scripts don't care whether it's a construction product or not. They're consuming all of those EPDs into what we just have as an unsupported category right now. And that's just kind of waiting for somebody to um, tap into it uh, and understand that it's there and start to think about how they could do what we've done for construction, for comparisons and accounting uh, for other, for other uh, sectors. Um, it is, it's great to finally find a global standard for how we can disclose this information. And if we've got the digital standard on top of it, um, we just need those solutions that bring that to market. 
So wait a minute. So I think if I heard you correctly and, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you're saying is that the EPD data exists for many of the classes of products that you built an infrastructure or a platform that in some ways is, is, uh, is uh, detail agnostic. In other words, it isn't specific and only related to construction that I could, for instance, be buying the next jacket um, on an e-commerce site, and I could actually um, eventually get to the point where we can understand the carbon footprint of this jacket that I'm gonna be wearing. Is that, is, that, is that really possible? Is that the reality? Is that where this thing can go? It is, and I will tell you that you know, on the weekends, my husband will say, when aren't you reading a book? What I'm doing in EC3 is going into the unsupported category, and I can use our construction project builder to actually build an outfit already, where I can go source the EPD for my jeans and my shirt, and my shoes and I could look at the carbon impacts of them because I have the data and the tool and I can access it right now <laughs> um, as, an, as an admin. But um, yeah, it's definitely there. I mean, I think if we think about just looking around all the things that we build with and buy has a carbon footprint and we should be able to understand that, you know, in real time almost. Oh, that is amazing. It's probably, uh, that's probably something many of us would want to follow up on. If we did want to do that, what's the best way to do it? Is there a website? Is there a platform? How do we engage in this? You know, if we want to take this further, is there a way for us to participate? Sure. So there's um, buildingtransparency.org is where there's everything about our nonprofit. There's a section there on our open API where you can access the data. If you're wanting to get into the unsupported data, I, I would just say, you know, you know, contact us so we can figure out how to support that um, extraction of the data that right now is just currently kind of sitting there. Um, and, and we're happy to, to collaborate on any, of, any, any use of the data. That's really what we're all about. Stacy, you've left us with such a great understanding of your journey of what you're doing at transparency, buildingtransparency.org, and more importantly, um, ideas that we can take advantage of and, and take it further. And I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Um, you and I both live in Seattle. We both happen to be in a really beautiful part of the world. Um, it's so nice to be speaking with you, albeit on Zoom. And I look forward to spending more time with you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Take care.